Hi, I'm Jim Eves, and you're listening to the Honest Filmmaker podcast, career advice from people in the business. Today, I'm joined by writer, director, and film lecturer, Pat Higgins. Pat has directed a whopping nine films, both features and anthology picks. His last film was the number one project on Kickstarter and closed out the 2022 Fright Fest Film Festival. Pat's also written a number of scripts, some of which have been optioned. In this chat, I spoke to Pat about script writing, the logistics of getting a script optioned, getting an agent, crowdfunding your films, and practical tips for directing on set. Enjoy. Pat, thank you for joining me. It's absolute pleasure to be here, Jim. <laughs> good, good, good. So uh, I want to start at the beginning of the filmmaking process because you are a writer, director, and all other strings to your bow. With the screenwriting process, could you talk me through how you approach that when you start a screenplay? It, funnily enough, I think every project's different. There's usually some kind of a seed um, that starts off. Now, that can be an idea. It, sometimes for me, it's a line of dialogue. Sometimes it's an image. Sometimes it's whatever. And sometimes it's a brief. Sometimes it's simply that uh, in order to get to the marketplace at a certain time or whatever, you kind of go, oh, okay, these kind of movies are hot at the moment. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I can put something together and might be able to sell it. So yeah. it, I think every single occasion has been something different. Sometimes it's a bit it's a bit mercenary and, and um, commercially minded. And sometimes it's a purely artistic flight of fancy, but I don't think there's any consistency for me, at least in terms of what is that, that, that seed, that spark that, yeah. that kicks uh, all off. And it's a, it's an interesting one actually, because I think I don't, I might be talking out of turn here, but I think we're both a little bit cutthroat in that respect in that we do having been to Cannes, look around the film market, all that malarkey, we do, have to listen to what's selling particularly in our genre would you say oh yeah absolutely i uh, i mean um i i want to work on projects that i'm interested in and my level of interest and engagement can be on a genre level it can be on a character level there needs to be something that's hooked me into writing it you know i i, I don't want to sit and, and work on car adverts i want to work mm. on narrative fiction but within that if i know all right if you cast a 24 year old male in this role you will sell it and if you cast a 75 year old male in this role you will not then there is a, a commercial aspect that comes in and goes right okay i will put together my package depending on, on what the market is is looking for i think you kind of have to do that uh i mean so i need i need some kind of artistic hook <laughs> otherwise i might as well just be doing something completely different but um but I'm happy to go, all right, what does the market want? And I will incorporate it from there. And I go into every meeting with that awareness as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not going to flounce out going, no, my artistic vision is that this will feature X, Y, and Z, if that's not what's going to sell, because who wants to make a movie that nobody watches? Very true. I think um, you probably had a better start with that than I did, because I think, what was the first one, Hellbride or... A uh, killer, killer. It's killer, killer, wasn't it? Trash, trash, trash house, house. Was my first one. Trash house. So trash that house was, was very. One, yeah. Was that female le lead? Mm. Was that one? Yeah. So, so I think. Yeah. My first film, I did go straight out of film school and did do that. I mean, you wouldn't know watching it now, but I did do that sort of artistic. You know, we want to be artists. This is what we're doing. We've got, yeah. you know, this this guy. I in really the lead didn't. And, yeah, <laughs> you didn't. You already knew. I, 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 I literally, I, I went, if I only ever make one movie, what what do I want? And I yeah. wrote down, basically, you know, I want I want chainsaws, I want zombies, I want slime up the walls, I want all this sort of nonsense. Because that was really what, you know, my B-movie heart, that's what I wanted to create. Yeah. Uh, and then I crossed off the bits that, that were out of my budget league, so no giant octopus on that one, all that sort of thing thing yeah i just kind of went through like that and 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 approached it, it in just a happy dopey kid in a candy store this is if i if i make one movie at least i've made something that sums me up a bit yeah i, I kind of wish i'd done that i think we uh the first two the second one had a killer clown in it so you know we did all right yeah. but the first one i think we um we shot it thinking it was this big you know i think we even it makes me cringe to say it but i think we even entered it into can at the time yeah. this kind of horror movie with yuri geller do you know what i mean and uh, we ended it to can because we took it so seriously and then 
when that completely failed, we looked back at it and went, oh, my God, it doesn't make any sense. And it's actually not got enough horror in it. It's not got enough excitement, which caused us to recut the whole thing because we'd not mm. sort of made that decision early on or thought at all about how we were going to sell the bloody thing. So you talked about uh, how you begin a screenplay. You've you've done these uh, talks about doing a screenplay in 30 days. Tell me about that. I'm yeah. curious about that because there is no way I could do that. Um, oh, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Honestly, just come to my talk and you can do it. You can, honestly. I mean, really, uh, underneath the the methodology of writing a movie in 30 days, which I've got down pretty well now, but yeah. underneath that methodology, um, many, many years ago, I quit smoking. And mm -hmm. all the books about how to quit smoking, underneath the 300 pages of waffle, are basically going, yeah, don't smoke any more cigarettes. Uh, that, that's really where you've got to go in order to quit smoking and i think sometimes screenwriting is the same thing you want to write scripts in 30 days you write one <laughs> mm, yeah, i think yeah. that, there is an element of that but for me i mean that particular methodology is it, i say it's actually write a movie in, in 30 days it's not it's actually 10 uh because the the structure that i work around is 10 days of planning um where you plan out all of the arcs you plan out your character arcs you plan out the way the narrative is going to work every, the way everything's going to tick in with genre the way that your theme is going to be connected all the way through it um all of these sorts of things so you spend 10 days planning and you get the whole thing broken down into 40 bits of business 40 post-it notes um that will be you know i hesitate to use scenes because then people mm -hmm. think oh but some scenes are very short and so i prefer to use some bits of business but so you've got your 40 bits of business uh and then the the central 10 days out of the 30 days is actually uh dictating off the top oh, of your okay. head looking yeah. at these looking at the the scene uh, look at the you know the post-it note knowing what's got to happen in it and dictating the dialogue off the top of your head and then running that through transcription software um for me, that means that all your dialogue comes out. There's one of the problems that I think particularly with uh, screenwriters when they're starting out is that their dialogue clunks. And mm. sometimes it's it looks beautiful on the page and you wouldn't realise how poor the dialogue is until some poor bugger actually has to say it. Yeah. And then when someone actually has to say it, you go, wow, that dialogue really <laughs> doesn't work at all. It's horribly overwritten and no one would say it. But when you're reading it on the page, it works in your head. Mm. Um so uh, I think that one of the advantages of using dictation when you're, you're writing, particularly speed writing, is that your mouth is not going to come up with those kind of things. You, yeah. You're going to come up with dialogue that sounds much more naturalistic, that sounds much more like people would, would actually do. So you do 10, 10 days in the middle uh, of dictation against those. So it's four post-it notes a day um of dictating those and then you end up with this horrible rough draft after so 20 days in you've got a rough draft that stinks to high heaven you would never show it to anybody else you would never whatever and then you've got 10 days to basically beat the thing into shape which is done by uh looking at different elements of it be they the the character paths uh be they individual scenes be they the way that scenes link together the way that everything refers back to the theme and you do different passes for each one of those things to try and kick that that script into shape how do you actually feel about writing because i don't i don't think i enjoy it at all until i'm on my like third to last draft and i'm actually enjoying reading it and it makes sense but up until that point i really don't enjoy it what about you I th the whole filmmaking process weirdly enough um i spend all of it thinking i enjoy the other bits more Mm -hmm. So when I'm writing, I'm thinking, oh, God, I just wish I was on set. When I'm on set and I'm tired and I'm stressed, I was thinking, oh, God, I wish I was in post-production. When I'm in post-production, I'm like, I'm sick to death of this movie. I just want to be writing another one. And it's only at the point where I realize that actually I don't enjoy any of the process at all. Yeah, that makes me wonder why the hell I've spent my entire life doing the same thing over and over and over again. So I, I don't know, man. Um, apparently, I don't like any of it, but but I kind of do. There's 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 joy in all of it, I guess. So yeah, this I think I know I know exactly what you mean. There's the, the writing thing. I think yeah, there's times when I just don't enjoy it. And it is an absolute slog. The directing thing. I know exactly what you mean. Super tired on set, but there are some days on there when you, especially when you're when you've got the blood out. And you're, yeah, yeah. you know, everyone comes home covered in the red stuff. That's when you've um, you've had a good day filming. Um, yeah. But I know exactly what you mean. Time, all of those things, just to get on top of you. Um, so, so looking at your uh, screenwriting, you've had 
uh scripts produced by other people you've had yes. am i right in saying you had a script option at one point yeah Did yeah um I, I sold uh i've I've had scripts option both in the UK and the US. Mm -hmm. uh, in the one that optioned in the US, the option ran out and returned to me, unfortunately. So yeah. I got, got some money for it, but uh, but the movie didn't get made. So so that was a shame. Um, but on the other hand, I've you know it, it's come back home. Yeah. Um, so you know, no harm, no foul, and it brought a few quid with it. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So so to people who wouldn't understand that process, was that linked through an agent, or was that something you'd to sort of uh networked into yourself the option on that one kind of came uh, uh, there was a director attached to that project we signed a shopping contract with the the director which basically means that the director is then authorized to approach people and go this is my next project and that can help get the the production up and running um but what actually happened there was that the the shopping contract ran out mm. uh and the the director went on to another project wasn't able to to kind of pick that up and pursue it but uh, that that route that had already been kind of made that production company said well we're, we're still interested in optioning it in whatever form you can you know potentially do that mm. so so that initial uh contact was actually made via the proposed director on the shopping contract and then that fell apart and then it they optioned it anyway and then they still didn't get it made so i mean every step of the way there's always potential frustration yeah and if you were if someone was in that situation how you know what advice would you give them are there how did you sort the legalities of the contract was that you at home sifting through it or did you give it to someone how did you get um, around in, that? In the case of the in the case of the shopping contract, the director themselves wrote that up, um, and I went through it very carefully and, and was very happy with it. They were someone that I trusted, and, and, you know, and that's not always the be all and end all. It's worth having making sure that everything is legally watered, like, no matter how much you trust people. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of the option, it was actually an extraordinarily simplistic um, option. It mm -hmm. was literally two paragraphs. Uh, and so in some ways that's more reassuring it depends you you do sometimes get these things where it's like 16 pages and then you get something else that's two paragraphs and you never really know it was my first time also dealing with an american uh an american option mm -hmm. as i say we i'd previously sold scripts in the uk um but this this was a sort of la based company um and at the end of the day that then adds another layer of complexity because i go okay well if i'm going to get a, a uk lawyer to look through it if anything went wrong with this it would be looked at under under la law not mm -hmm. not the the tv show well, um <laughs> yeah so 20 minutes in and he name checks <laughs> la law because he knows he's down with the kids hashtag uh, la law that's going all over this video. Ab absolutely <laughs> absolutely yeah so but you know at, at the end of the day even if i got a uk entertainment lawyer to look at it Mm. you've got multiple countries and so partly i think that there is an element of you need to look at what the intent is behind it and mm. it's possibly easier to do that on two paragraphs than it is on 16 pages but yeah 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 very true um and so sold stuff ones to america sold ones in the uk and are you with an agent at the moment have you been with an agent what was that experience like how did you get the agent for yeah, to you know get their own agent. I have uh, yeah, I have I've been with an agent uh previously I'm not with an agent at the moment. Uh the agent that I got actually I got from uh, a cold approach which I uh, I've oh, really? since understood really doesn't happen. Yeah. Nearly everybody else I've ever spoken to who's had an agent it's been oh no it was an introduction at a party oh. or it was whatever. I mean I had several credits under my belt uh but it was literally I uh, uh, one afternoon I sent out like three inquiries and then one of them got back and asked for a meeting and mm. uh but I, as i understand it that's not usually the way it goes i think i was extraordinarily lucky yeah. uh and i guess because i had a bit of a track record on me as well mm. um the on my experience with uh with having an agent it got me into meetings that i wouldn't have otherwise necessarily been able to get into i liked my agent a lot we understood each other a lot but when they moved on from the company i couldn't find another fit within that agency and i went back to representing myself so i didn't actually make any sales or any options during the time i was represented uh which is no i don't think any reflection on the agent i had it's mm -hmm. just you know the way it breaks down but on the other hand i have sold movies myself without an agent so i guess yeah. you can read that whichever way yeah and I, I remember i think we were at what we were together at a london screenwriting thing i think you were in the audience with me and there was an agent <clears throat> 
talking to scriptwriters about how to get an agent. And I remember uh, all of the questions from the audience was essentially, how do I get an agent? And they all kind of got buffed away. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, he just sort of said, look, don't call us, win some competitions, get some credits under your belt, and then we'll come to you. Um, yeah. Which is a little disheartening, I think. If your yeah, focus is script writing and you're kind of out in the wilderness, aren't you, trying to find people to make your stuff or no. trying to find someone to even read it, um, that is a little depressing. But um, I guess, like you say, it's making those connections. I think that no matter how good you are as a writer of spec scripts, until you've been through the process of production and you've sat and watched something being made from one of your own scripts with an audience, uh, I think you're missing a part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And I think that there are agents that feel, I can't accompany you th through that forest. You need yeah. to go through that forest on your own. Um, because where you go, oh, no, this script needs this three-page monologue about his budgie dying when he was six, uh, when you're sat with a festival audience and they're lost, you know, you're losing the festival audience, they're not engaging with it as much as you'd want, and then you think, oh, Jesus Christ, and we've got a three-page monologue about his budgie dying when he was six. Yeah. Still to come, it changes the way that you process your screenwriting. Yeah, and it's a little bit like that moment when you pitch your film to somebody and you watch for those kind of cues as to whether it's yeah. crap or whether it's actually got their interest and even yeah. that when you're starting out is quite intimidating telling God gotcha, yeah, yeah. what you're making without thinking oh this is crap or worrying oh they might steal my idea or something yeah they really won't they won't yeah no they won't. they won't yeah whoever yeah. you are listening to this your idea is not if your idea is all you have to offer you're not bringing enough to the table. It needs to be your interpretation of that idea. Yeah. No one is out there going, oh, I will nick this, particularly not people with money, because mm -hmm. for them, it's a hell of a lot easier for them to buy your idea because then they don't get sued. Yeah, and even to the point where a lot of places, they won't take unsolicited scripts without you signing no. something anyway to say that they, yeah, they're yeah. not going to come after them later and go, oh, it, my thing's a bit similar to that thing in your yes. film. So yeah, there's a lot of um. There, there's probably more fearful of, of of looking at a project for those reasons. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so talks about the script writing part. If we go to your last project, Power Tool Cheerleaders versus the Boy Band of the Screeching Dead. Right. So let's start with that. At what point did you decide one that was a good title and two that it wasn't? And, it, and I'm not saying it has at all because clearly there was an appetite on crowdfunding and people are all over the movie. So how do you know that my fear would have been that title's too long, that's going to turn people off, that title's too long, people aren't going to remember it, you know, all of those things. Why didn't you, what made you sort of persevere with that? Luckily, I think I'm a genius. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well done. <laughs> and I ignore everything that everybody tells me. Um, yeah. And I just plow my own furrow. And sometimes that furrow goes right into the dirt. And sometimes just by the law of averages, by pig-headedly sticking with what I think is funny, uh, it, you know, just the law of averages, really. Something's got to work, you know. Okay, so talk. let's talk directing now. So for anyone who's about to direct their first feature film, they've raised the money, they're going to make it. Um, what What is that like? And I guess I'm trying to compare your first ever day on your first ever film set directing, compare that to how you are now. Are you the same? Are you completely different? What's What can people expect? I think um, one of the things that nobody ever really talks about, at least when I was doing a degree, nobody ever really spoke about talking to actors. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about uh, directing from the point of view of, oh, you know, this shot, which ultimately, if you particularly if you storyboard, it ends up really being in the hands of your DOP at that point. Um, you know, it, it, when it comes to how, how the lighting works and all of that sort of thing, it's not really, there's a lot of directing that's about talking to actors and nobody ever really talks about that during, during the time when you're getting ready to direct stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, you know, first day on, on Trash House where I suddenly realized, oh, these aren't my mates. These are actors. And I, I'm, exp they look to me for answers. They look to me for guidance. They look to you for, for reassurance and all of those sorts of things. Actors to me, 
when you come out of uni or even when you're at uni they're a little bit scary the professional yeah. actors and you're kind of not sure how to interact with them and I, my advice would be to go and do like a drama course or be in a play or something so you can yeah, feel yeah. it from the other side because i know you've done a bit of acting yourself um, yeah i'm not so, good but uh, but i think it it does help to do it just just from an empathy point of view yeah it gives you that perspective but um yeah knowing some of the things I've said to actors just make me cringe now when I'm, you know, big, do it bigger. They're just kind of like notes that don't really mean anything yeah. uh, rather than chatting to them about the process they're going through and remembering that they're trying to figure stuff out. They don't know exactly what I'm thinking just because they've no. read the script. And also I think what you miss out on if you don't have that dialogue is the magic things that happen when they say, or things that save you trouble later down the line where they're like, well, why would I do that? Yeah. it's two ways of taking that one is will you do it like that because that's how i wrote it and that's how i want it or the other way to take that is yeah actually let's stop and talk about this because we might have ballsed up somewhere yeah. let's figure out why you're doing that and it might be that that leads to a nice little moment between characters because the camera picks everything up and you want to make sure you sort of capture that magic um, i i love I, i'm a big believer and to be honest uh, a lot of the time it's my director of photography al uh, reminds me to do this because I get very focused on we've done it move on we've done it move on you yeah. know I, I do get into that because again having produced the early movies as well you get very much into that headset and you're kind of going have I got what I want if I've got what I want then I can move on and quite a lot of the time um, Al will remind me particularly if we're not running up against time that I'm always much happier if I can do a hell with it take at the end mm -hmm. um, where just do it different so if someone's done something very clipped and very precise, try it exploding. Try it, you know, just try everything that you've done up until this point. Let's do one take where you just do it different. Mm. And the cast really like it. They love it as a as a as a blow off steam at the end of the thing. And it kind of works as a palate cleanser as well. So as much as I'm forever trying to go on, go no, we've got it cut, and Al will go, we've got time, do a wild one, and I'm like, yes, yes, yes. And half the time they end up being the versions that are in there as well. So uh, yeah, it, it shouldn't come down to my DOP to remind me to do it, but it does sometimes. <laughs> it's good that he's there. It's good that he's there. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh, he, he saved my ass more times than I ever cared to think about. Uh, oh, this is going to sound like a stupid uh, question then, but what uh, what on students learning? at uni that you think is important? Maybe you do teach your students this, but what is it that unis don't prepare students for? I think a, a lot of the time they're just not industry ready. You get students coming out with sometimes a fantastic practical skill set. Um, and, and I think there is a blind spot to how easily they can piss people off. Uh, as in, I, I think that there is, uh, if people don't take time to understand the way that everybody's roles into into relax, you know, I, I I really very much hope that that students emerge. Um, that if you know, I've lectured on a number of different courses over the years in different universities, different colleges, uh, different levels, all that sort of stuff, and I'd always hope that um, students come out ready to to be on set be that in television, be that in film. And I think a lot of the time that's not necessarily the case. People will pursue their own the thing that they're most fascinated with, be that anything from color grading to sound mixing or whatever, the thing that the thing that enticed them onto a course in the first place. And then I think that they, if they don't have a proper appreciation of the way that all of the different job roles into, into you know, into react, into react, that's not quite right, uh, interact, there's a better word, the, the different job roles interact with one another and the fact that by asking, you know, by stepping on someone's toes or um, uh, stepping outside of their own job role, they can really alienate people really quickly. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. I think it, there's a there's a lack of being ready to shoot, um, yeah. and it, it just generally that's that's the downfall. That's the whole missing when people when students come through education. I think, and so yeah. that's the thing that I. I would encourage all universities to try and deal with because certainly it's that's something that I try and focus on. Do you have a motto you live by, whether it be in life in general or that you apply just to the film set? Um, I think I think always always treating everybody like gold is that's the key. It's the key to so much 
to to make sure that you you build those relationships and keep those relationships and treat other people the way that you'd want to be treated yourself mm -hmm. i think ultimately that's more important than any skill you know you know if you're if you're a competent cameraman who everybody loves to have on set um that's better than being an absolutely top draw camera person who uh who pisses people off yeah. um so i think actually that yeah always try and treat everybody um really really well and also don't be afraid to fail fail publicly fail over and over again um i think it's only when you fail that you realize what the limit of your your skill set is uh if you're cruising along going hey i haven't failed at anything then there might be another you know huge amount of stuff that you're capable of doing that you don't know you only know when you've hit your limits when you screw up so don't be afraid to screw up i'll put links to pat's projects in the description so you can check them out for yourself please do make sure you subscribe for more career advice from people in the business.